Do you like to laugh? You have a good sense of humor. No, so so do you have a good sense of humor? You seem to. Well, give me a chance to don't laugh. You married him, didn't you? Yes, but I didn't know him that well. Oh. Well, you can't make that excuse now. Huh? It's too late. No, it's too late. Well, you can't undo it. Not no, really. No, no, no. <laughs> I guess you could, but I uh, know, but you don't want to. No, I don't want to. No, no, no. 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 That would be worse. Rita and Jim Houston have shared their lives, raising their children, and building Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia. A Christian theologian, Jim Houston became Regent's founding principal in 1970. Rita made it her business to extend her hospitality to all in need of a friendly smile and a good meal. Her lifelong gift of welcoming strangers springs from her own childhood. Now dealing with Alzheimer's, Rita's love of serving others continues to shine. <laughs> Until we went back to our bedrooms to get dressed. It does seem that in our, um, mm. in our basal uh, memory, there are elements from childhood that uh, need to be sometimes elicited in old age. And uh, one of the things that Rita always grew up with was that her mother was the soul of hospitality. And during the war, uh, many young officers were uh, brought for a Sunday lunch or for the weekend rest from their military duties. Uh, and so she grew up to imitate her mother with hospitality. And so today, what is most significant for Rita is always to keep asking me each day, and who are we going to invite for a meal? And Who's going to come next? Well, it, we're limited in how much we can do ourselves, so we are now b booking a place to have dinner every week with uh, some couple that we share together. And it's on these occasions of hospitality where Rita really lights up and expresses herself. People with Alzheimer's or other forms of memory loss have not gone away. They may be harder to find, but the good news is that the person you love never loses their personhood. The ways to reach them in the present are by tapping into their passions and connecting with them. This connection may be through hospitality, painting, singing, sports, cooking, poetry, the ways are as varied as there are humans. By touching a deep interest, you are building meaningful, personal relationships today. Are you sure I'm 86? Yes. How old did you think you were? I didn't know whether I was going that way or this way. What did you think you were doing? I thought I was going in between. Rita Houston yes. is in studio today Love. with Vancouver author Love. Kathy Borey, recording the, the words of Kathy's mother, Joan. Sea. Joan lived with Alzheimer's Ooh, for seven years. Sea. Kathy was her principal caregiver. Do you think when As her mother lost we'll cognitive ability, the manner in which she spoke changed. Know. Joan began speaking poetically. Kathy recorded her and took notes. Rita Houston reads Hold Joan Borey's words. Will there be more stories? Oh, yes. A lot of more stories. <laughs> now, Kathy, was your mom always poetic before the diagnosis? She wasn't poetic at all. 
and uh, you know I was expecting this this slow descent into nothingness and in fact the opposite happened and it took me by complete surprise you know I was just trying to think about the first time it happened and I, I remember we were in this cafeteria uh, in a mall and it was a very depressing place it was full of uh, wheelchairs and walkers and we used to go in all the time and I was feeling quite down about everything really and I wanted to ask her advice about something and I wasn't sure if she still had the capacity to, to answer my questions in the way that she had done so well before but I thought well I've got nothing to lose I might as well ask so I said to her mom what do you do if you love somebody but he doesn't love you and without skipping a beat she says go find someone else <laughs> and it was so funny but it was also very good advice so I, I just kept going and I just, I wrote it down on, the, on a napkin. I still have the white coffee stained napkin in my files. And I think it was that moment where I thought, there's more going on here than I thought and that I was expecting and that I'm, I'm doing her a disservice by having limiting expectations. And after that, I started to record our conversations and she just continued to amaze me. I think I'm more concentrated and sort of, I sort of am. It's become part of me. Something has gone. Something bad has gone. I think we reached the limit of our soul of misery and we're now poof. And we're just doing the best we can. We're not feeling like that. We just do. We just are. I think that's the way it is. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love thee. Please don't take my sunshine away. She was very musical. She taught piano. She played piano. She probably could have been a really quite well known, but she was stage shy and she didn't want to do it. But she was performing at age six. Perfect pitch, beautiful singer, and uh, we used to sing together all the time. She, she had some other creative interests like gardening and things like that, but uh, I'd say that the music was most important to her, and we used that all the way through her illness, playing songs or singing um, ad lib all the time. We used to have this little game where I would sing the first note, and then she would try to guess what it was, and, and she guessed what it was every single time. And so that carried us through in a big way. Joan Borey enjoyed the process of her daughter taping her. Well, I think one of the things that really made a difference to our times together, because I was with her all the time, and those hours, they're long hours, they're long days for both of us, was that when I decided I would start to tape her, she loved that. And, I mean, who wouldn't love being taped? Because it means you're important and that what you say is worthwhile. So I'd get the tape recorder out and say, well, I'm... I'd like to tape you if that's all right. And she would just, you know, sit up and uh, it, it gave her value. So that whole process and experience not only added quality to our days, but gave her a, a feeling of self-confidence that I think she would not have had otherwise. You know, what, what people tend to do is ignore people who have Alzheimer's or put them in a corner in front of the TV, useless things, instead of listening and asking. Through a long season of reading, writing, and remembering, Kathy wrote the long hello for her mother. In the book, recently launched in New York City, Kathy shares her life journey memories with Joan Borey. I think probably she would be very clear that she would want people to respect and honor the ongoing and enduring spirit and soul uh, of her humanity, that that, con that continues right the way through to the last breath, and that, that that's what people should be doing uh, when they're caregiving other people, is to recognize that no matter what changes, and if that person doesn't recognize you or they don't remember things, there's still, still an enduring human spirit that deserves to be honored and celebrated. Are you in a good mood? Okay. Down the coast from Vancouver, near Eugene, Oregon, 
validation therapy creator Naomi File is serving breakfast to her husband Ed. Ed and Naomi have been partners in life, raising their children and collaborating on videos featuring Naomi's validation therapy. Now living near their son, Ed Jr., Naomi tends to Ed Sr., who is in his early 90s. He has Alzheimer's. Naomi is his wife, his love, and his principal caregiver. Okay, well, let's figure out what we want to do today. Do we, do you want to do um, painting? Did I bring any painting stuff with mm -hmm. me? You did. Got it. It's over there on that table. And there's a flower over there. Oh. And you were going to paint the flower. Well, Ed's managed very well. He has a wonderful way. Um, he has a, a wonderful way of thinking of good He uses humor a whole lot. When he feels um, bad, so if he can't do something, or if he doesn't know where he is, he um, kind of covers it with humor. I don't know if it's a matter of covering it, but just finding humor in all situations. And he kind of senses when things are difficult between the caregiver, say, and me, and he's able to like make jokes. So he's adapted to being here, and he enjoys the exercise, he enjoys painting, enjoys what he can still do, and he is able to accept what he can't do. This is all our children. The four children. <laughs> huh? Yes. They're all looking good. They are. So I think we're slowly making the adjustment. I think it's mainly for me as to learning to be independent in a dependent situation. That's the hardest for me. This man had never painted before, ever. Never even drawn A happy event took place one evening in Beverly Hills, California. An artist was having his first major exhibit. His family was present. His wife, Ethelda, his son, Danny, and wife, Ellen, and his two granddaughters. They flew in from Alabama to honor their husband, father, and grandfather. Lester Potts grew up working in a sawmill in rural Alabama, carving out a life for his family. He was a great father and an energetic helper in his community and in his church. Alzheimer's disease claimed his speech and his smile until a local center called Caring Days helped Lester find a new way to express himself. Now, Mother, we got Dad's original art right here. Yes. And what is that? that? Well, honey, that's the first one he brought home. The first one is the hummingbird. And he brought it in and showed it to me. And I said, oh, that's so pretty, honey. Who did that for you? And he said, I did it myself. Mm -hmm. And see, he wrote his name right mm -hmm. there. And that is his his little printing. And he was very proud of that. Oh, he was so proud of I guess, so you know, because up until that time, we had no idea no. that he could do anything like no. this. Through my own father's artistic expression in the midst of Alzheimer's disease, I came to know that the human being, the person, the self, still persists despite this affliction. Lester's spirit, who he essentially was as a person, emerged in his art. While the disease progressed, he was able to express his being through painting, encouraged by loving caregivers. As neurologist Daniel Potts saw his father Lester respond to art therapy at Caring Days in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, his research and work as a neurologist showed him how people affected with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias were able to break through the haze of their condition and connect 
with their loved ones. And what happened was is that Lester began to express the content of his heart through the art. And things came out that were very deeply buried inside Lester. Pictures from his childhood, saws, his father's hat, lace-up shoes, the old home place, fences, etc. He even painted wood rings over and over and over again, things that he had looked at as a child. And I believe that that creative opportunity, the opportunity for Lester to express himself, uh, created healing. You see, Dad was going down a steep course, and he stabilized for about a year and a half to two years after the art, uh, uh, he began to create the art. And this delayed uh, us having to place him in a facility, I think, for two years. So Lester was able to stay home that much longer. And not only that, he came home smiling. He came home proud. This is a man who could not hammer a nail anymore. Somebody took the hammer away, put a paintbrush in, and put him a canvas down, and he was able to express himself. And the beauty that he expressed is unimaginable. He painted for about four and a half years, and he painted some incredible scenes. Lester got better. His behavior was better. His outlook was better. He quit crying. He smiled again, and it provided respite for my mother. The person, you see, was still there. The person of Lester Potts was still there. The emotional self of Lester Potts was still there. Could he speak in a full sentence? No. Could he remember what he had eaten that morning for breakfast? No. But was the core of his identity still intact? It absolutely was. And it expressed itself through art because the roadblock of his language, Alzheimer's had laid a roadblock, a curtain over his face. It had stopped the language from coming out. But it couldn't stop the content of his character from coming out. And that's what came out through the art. We have four and a half years, over a hundred watercolors that Lester created. Some of the last ones are some of the most incredible because they were truly expressions of his soul and the content of his character. What it takes is a connection to a theme or a deeply held passion. This place, it's just too crazy for me today. It wasn't crazy until you got here. <laughs> It can be baseball, singing favorite songs, painting, poetry, cooking, family, a pet. This connection builds relationship. Whatever the hook is, it trumps cognitive thinking and leads to a fully lived and shared event. Pleasant present moments bring satisfaction to the person and create bonds between the caregiver and loved one. One, two, three. <laughs> there you go. Whoa. Oh, I like I it. it. Look at that. Do you have favorite songs that you like? Favorite melodies? No, I don't think so. Just I love music, mm -hmm. not the sound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Crimmond, I think, is uh, one of your oh. favorites. Oh, that was because it was father's, too. <laughs> yeah. I love so, that. I love that. So your father, he loved it. I couldn't tell you what it is, but I could have heard it. Is this da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da? Well, is that it? No, no, I mean, you sing it. I was just thinking, I remember Cremon, uh, um, the Lord's I, my shepherd, same text. I don't have the huh? voice my father had. <laughs> yes. In the same way that Kathy Borey noticed her mother Joan expressing herself more poetically with Alzheimer's, validation therapy creator Naomi File says that in the past, her husband Ed was more visual. He is changing. You swirl because you swirl the brushes. <laughs> there is something very poetic that comes out of Ed. Like, I, I, as long as I feel safe, he'll say. He'll say things that are really very meaningful. And, very, and Ed was never poetic. He was always very visual and doing things with his hands. But now he's more thoughtful. And I really appreciate what he can do now more. And I'm so, we're so excited. You think so? Oh, sure. How? Every way. Every way? <laughs> As his wife Rita lived with her Alzheimer's, as did he as her caregiver, Jim Houston pondered their future. 
I think the, uh, the first thing that challenged me about it was, uh, is this going to be the worst phase of our life or the best phase of our life? And uh, I just felt uh, prayerfully that it should be spiritually the most enriching phase of one's life. And I think I was able to enter into that because I had always had in the trajectory of my own thinking and my own life that primarily I was not having an identity as a professional, but I had an identity as being a person. And to be personal means that you are intrinsically relational. So that if you lose a function like the loss of memory or the loss of anything else in old age, that disability is not necessarily a spiritual liability, but rather it can be an asset for something that is more spiritual, even though it's less physical. And so that's how we entered into it. And so I said, my dear, this is going to be the best phase of our life. What is clear to those of us who care for loved ones with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias is that it is not important what day of the week it is. What is important is creating a culture of compassion. Creating relationship now. Okay, that's a good question. Finding a place where everyone feels safe. That's the first step. Don likes to know where he's going. I I know this about you. I know. And, and this is requiring you to give up some control. One more time. One more. All the way around. Okay. And when you look at this, what would the title be? What would you call it? Pierced heart. Pierced heart. Validation therapy creator Naomi File, whose whole life has been spent caring for old people, is now old herself. She continues her validation therapy training sessions around the world. She deals with physical limitations imposed by her own aging. And she cares for her husband, Ed, living life with Alzheimer's. People have heard of validation because it's been around so long, since 1963, and some of them have seen a film, or a lot of them have seen my workshops. Um, but they really don't know validation because they haven't had training. And I think the interest isn't there, here. Well, first of all, I think a lot of other people have taken the ideas because it started so long ago. Like person-centered care, for example, means you care about the person. Well, that's what validation is all about. And that started many, many years ago, say in 63, um, so a lot of people have taken the ideas of validation and are teaching it, but in a much simpler way, because it involves empathy and getting into the world of the old person. So if someone says, there's my mother, it's much easier to use uh, what they teach now is redirection, um, diverting the person and then lying to them. They call it a therapeutic lie and saying, oh, don't worry, sit down, and your mother will be right back. She's right around the corner. Here, let's, let's play some music. And the person will sit down and play some music, and they'll feel better for a few minutes. But the next two minutes, where's my mother? Whereas the validation worker would get into the world of the person and say, you, you miss your mother. When did you last see her? It would pick up the emotion of the person. And that way the person will trust the validation worker and we'll say, well, and we'll talk about her mother and see her mother and be with her mother. And a few minutes later, and we have this on movie film, that same old lady will say, you know, my mother died a long time ago because she needed to express her feelings to her mother with her mother. And once she, she trusted the worker and once she expressed her feelings, oh, she felt much better. So the goal is not that your mother's alive and your mother's dead with validation. The goal is to listen with empathy and reduce the anxiety of the person and let the person do it themselves. Whereas the goal of um, these other techniques are to redirect the person, to calm them down right away. And um, if they're crying, to have them stop crying and feel happy. 
Well, it's not a bad goal, but the they, people can't just suddenly feel happy. Whereas if a person is crying, the validation worker will say, you're sad. You miss somebody. And the person will cry, and crying is healing. Whereas with the other techniques, they don't want people to cry. So the other techniques calm people down for a few minutes, but they're kind of superficial. Whereas the validation techniques help the person deal with whatever they're needing to deal with. It isn't curing the person, but it's just helping them express themselves so that they feel better. And then they can go have some tea or play music. So thank, I thank Rita, I thank others that I'm in touch with who are old and having to care for, that they're bringing things out of me that are potentials for my own growth. And so it's not a burden, it's a privilege.